Today I will speak to you about HRCT in diffuse lung diseases. I'm starting a series on this um, and the first short presentation will essentially talk about techniques um, required to produce great quality HRCT images. Please remember that to be able to interpret um, interstitial lung and airway diseases a good quality study is a must. Why am I harping on this? About 70 to 80 percent of the HRCT studies done in our country on any given day are of substandard quality and this then hampers our ability to accurately interpret these images and which is why this presentation. None of this is rocket science. What we need to do is follow some principles, be a little patient with our patients and make them understand how to hold their breath correctly in end inspiration. Breath hold is critical. Otherwise, we land up getting images like this that are blurred on which we make a diagnosis of ground glass attenuation and then land up creating all sorts of problems. What we require are images like this. This is the same patient with the image in end inspiration where there is no ground glass attenuation and on images like this we will not make mistakes as far as interpretation is concerned. Please remember that there are good numbers of patients in our country who have never held their breaths and, and they're quite scared. If you were to tell them that hold your breath for about three to five seconds, um, they would perhaps not understand the concept and therefore it's important for a technologist or a nurse or a ward boy or whoever is there in the center or the department to sit with the patient, make sure that the patient has understood the concept and if required, mind the process out for the patient so that the patient understands what it means. Here is a patient who seems to have a mosaic pattern and we might either start looking at this as airway disease or we might say there is ground glass attenuation and talk about hypersensitivity pneumonitis. But if you look carefully, you actually see an increasing gradient of whiteness as we go from non-dependent to dependent. And when we see something like this, we should be alerted to the fact that this is probably an expiratory image. This is what we thought when these, this patient came for a second opinion. So we repeated the images about a week later and on the inspiratory images obtained at the same level there is really nothing this is a normal study this is what good quality expiratory images look like you see a gradient of increasing whiteness from non-dependent to dependent and this when we see something like this we should pretty much start either obtaining better quality uh, inspiratory images or disregard these images as far as the HRCT interpretation is concerned. And you can see here at the same level, at virtually the same time in the same patient, the pristine black images um, that we get when we obtain these images in full inspiration. Another way to tell whether the image is in expiration is to look at the posterior wall of the trachea. If it is concave inwards, that implies that these images are in expiration. Having said that, you would also require an expiratory set of images in a good number of patients where we suspect airway disease or emphysema and even in patients with interstitial lung diseases presenting for the first time. So it does get a little complicated where you explain to the patient how to hold his or her breath, how to do it in end inspiration and then how to do it in end expiration as well. But this is required and this is something that should be followed as well. This is why it makes a difference. Here is a patient who seems to have a normal scan. If you were to look closely, you might say that there is some increased lucency in the left lower lobe. But on the expiratory image, and you can identify that by seeing the gradient in the normal lung, you find that there is air trapping. So there's increased lucency, paucity of vessels and air trapping that tells us that this patient has left lower lobe constrictive bronchiolitis. We also require one millimeter or smaller slice uh, thickness scans. This is very straightforward and almost all the modern scanners would allow us to do that. With multi-detector scanners, in fact, what we now do is to obtain a volume stack retrospectively 
effectively reconstruct the images 1 mm at 0.5 mm intervals, get a stack of 200 to 50, 300 images and then scroll through these images on the workstation. You also have another expiratory stack and you can put the two side by side so that you can assess the areas of air trapping better as well. In a few select cases we obtain prone images. You can see a patient here uh, of scleroderma who had normal pulmonary function testing. There are reticular opacities in the right lung base. The patient had come with the question is there interstitial lung disease and clearly to know this um, you need to put the patient in the prone position. Now if you find that these reticular opacities persist it means that they are real, they represent disease and this is an NSIP pattern consistent with uh, uh, scleroderma related interstitial lung disease. On the other hand here is a 55 year old gentleman who has reticular opacities again in the dependent segments. Uh, we're not sure whether this is real so we put the patient in the prone position. The reticular opacities have completely disappeared telling us that this represents gravity dependent density and is not relevant. So these are the most important parameters to work with when performing HRCT scans and to repeat. In all cases we require breath hold, we require images in full inspiration, um, we require an expiratory set in the vast majority of cases, 1 mm or smaller slice thickness scans and in a few select cases prone images. Remember none of this is really except for the slice thickness is related to the machine. It's all about sitting down with the patient, explaining to the patient what is required and then obtaining the image quality that we need. In the past, there used to be a lot of discussion of all these parameters, the KV, the MAS, where we should now just use the lowest, the scan time should be the fastest, the FOV is really irrelevant, but in the olden days we used to retrospectively retarget single lungs uh, when we used to film. The interslice gap is irrelevant because you get a stack now on the workstation and it's only in filming that we need to be careful in those setups and centers where filming is still important. So if that is the case then images like this are unacceptable. On film what we require are images that allow us to see the lung pleura interface and just about faintly see the rib margins. To conclude remember that good quality HRCT images are an absolute must before we start interpreting interstitial lung and airway diseases. And if we don't take the time to obtain good quality images, it takes about three to four minutes extra per patient uh, to do this. And all of this training can be done outside the scan room as well, in which case you don't really waste additional scan time. But if you don't do this, you will get images that are blurred, images on which we can miss findings, images on which we misinterpret findings that don't exist. And all of this will reduce our confidence and our ability uh, to make accurate diagnosis in patients with interstitial lung and airway disease.